Nourish My Soul is proud to present to you another episode of Radical Thursdays, where our From the Ground Up alumni, Bella and Kenya, are going to be talking to Sarah and Maya, who are from Bay Area Student Activists, and they are really doing work. They organized all across California for high school students to advocate against gun violence. Um, This is a generation that has grown up having safety drills um, for active shooters in their schools. It's a part of their daily life. And the trauma that that brings has really put a fire under a lot of students as they say, hey, this is not okay, this is not right. And this group is doing an amazing job of advocacy and changing legislation and um, advocating for our young people and their safety. They've begun to branch out into other areas of activism, and Bella and Kenya are going to be talking to them about that and talking to them about how young people can look for groups to become active in in their area too. So it's a really great episode, and I hope you enjoy it. And don't forget to comment and like this episode, subscribe to our podcast wherever you receive your podcasts, and share with others because we really appreciate that. Um, The more people we reach, the greater our influence and the more hope that we can bring to others. So here they are. Welcome back to Radical Thursdays. Um, This week we have two guests from Bay Area Student Activists. Um, We're very excited to hear what they are currently working on, what they have um, worked on in their community and impacting um, our nation. Um, Hope you enjoy and stay tuned. Hi, as Kenya said, we have two guests. The first one, both of them are from Bay Area Student Activists, but one of them is the president, um, her name's Sarah, and then the vice president as well. And she's also head of communications, who is Maya. So welcome. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, thank you. So can you just um, both let us know a little bit about who you are? Um, You're both still in high school, so what you're looking to study, if you go to college, what you plan on doing after high school if you decide not to? Absolutely, Maya, would you like to start or? Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I'm Maya. I go to Head Royce School in Oakland, California. Um, I'm not really sure. I'm kind of undecided, but I definitely want to keep doing, um, working with activism and social justice in college. So maybe a major related to that. Definitely. And I'm Sarah. Um, and I go to Oakland School for the Arts in Oakland, California also. And I actually study playwriting there. So I'm really passionate about theater in addition to social justice. But I'm actually looking to study culinary anthropology um, to kind of synthesize my interests in like food. So it's right up the alley of this podcast. That's so funny. Um, I think that uh, being from Oakland like has made me really interested in issues of like food justice and I think that I don't know even though my interests are like kind of seemingly disparate that they're actually interconnected. That's so cool. So um, Sarah you told us a little bit about about how um, your interests have translated a little bit into um, what you're doing now with (laughs) B-A-S-T-A. What'd you say? We actually go by BASTA. It's kind of like a... BASTA? Uh, okay, perfect. <laughs> um, so you told us a little bit how you, uh, how that translated and could you go a little bit more in depth, both of you, about how you started just to get in, how you started getting involved? Definitely. I mean, um, just as a, my, my answer, I think that gun violence has kind of been like seared into the consciousness of our generation, which sounds a little dramatic, but we were born in the aftermath of um, the Columbine shooting. When we were in elementary school was when the Sandy Hook shooting happened. And then in my freshman year of high school, same for Maya, um, the Stoneman Douglas shooting happened. And that kind of just was like too much um, to consider not getting involved in you know, advocacy to end gun violence. And also coming from Oakland, I think that a lot of people 
know that gun violence exists outside of school shootings. So kind of intersectional gun reform is also something that um, uh, that we're passionate about. Uh, so I got involved with March for Our Lives initially, then I kind of wanted to take that action of like marching in the streets to more like legislative level. So I heard about a group of kids from Head Royce Myers High School who were planning a lobby day to the state capitol in Sacramento to meet with um, lawmakers on common sense gun reform. So I joined and um, ended up stepping into leadership and kind of getting involved with the organization. Like I was treasurer for a few years and um, yeah, I've, I've been there and, and Maya's been around. Yeah. Um, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just saying that was really cool. <laughs> oh, okay, awesome. Yeah, I would say I kind of have the same experience, just like where it got to the point where I felt like I really had to do something. And I was lucky enough to have someone in my school who started the organization. So actually my brother that first year was the head of research. So I went on the first lobby day and I loved it. And I, the next year I just decided to get involved in leadership. I was secretary for a while, um, just bouncing around doing whatever needed to be do, done. Um, yeah. And yeah, I, that's how I got into it. And I was just, I've loved it ever since. And now we work on things other than gun violence, but that's where it started, the Stoneman Douglas shooting. It's interesting that you guys are, um, I suppose your brother's class of activists uh, got interested in it through uh, research or research lens. That's how <laughs> we got connected to our organization. Uh, we were in a class called AP Seminar. We were reading Omnivore's Dilemma. I don't know if you guys have read that before. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's just corn. It all goes back to corn. <laughs> um, and um, that's how we got into food justice. So that's really cool that research is beautiful. <laughs> so outside, you guys talked about how uh, originally it was gun violence from, and you guys have transitioned out of that or not so much out of it, but branched. What was kind of the moment you guys realized that you kind of want to branch out and you want to kind of just follow whatever the students uh, want to talk about and uh, activate, uh, activist, activite? <laughs> right. That's completely wrong, <laughs> but for. Um, I think, oh, go ahead, Sarah. Oh, I was just saying, I think that works as a verb. Sorry, the, the lag. But um, go ahead, Maya, and I have, I have something to say on that too after. Um, I think we did two years of gun control and we realized there was just so much more that affects students' lives. Um, Sarah and I, we haven't experienced gun violence in our lives, um, but we definitely like still feel scared about it. And we want to recognize that it is like more than just school shootings, like Sarah said. Um, and we definitely don't want to like say like, oh, it's over now that there hasn't been like a major school shooting because we know there's still rampant gun violence happening in Oakland right now. Um, but we did recognize that there are other issues that students care about and we kind of wanted to branch out and cover more ground. The reason we stuck with it for two years is because that, that was kind of our base. We had information we knew a lot about the legislation um but we decided to branch out sarah um and i mean actually just like as a quick note to that i think it's sometimes a little like less tangible about what it means to be affected by gun violence well i haven't experienced like a school shooting i have been at a park with friends when there was like a live shooting happening and that was kind of a formative experience for me where i was like oh <laughs> that's a reminder that um I don't know, this really exists outside of the fear of school shootings and kind of just like gun violence in, in my neighborhood too, that, you know, it's not necessarily like an issue that's directly impacted me, but like it's kind of present and that's what's scary about it. I've also kind of started to address that in like my playwriting a little bit recently, but um, I think that we realized exactly like Maya said two years ago that, I don't know, that, you know, issues that affect students really go, extend beyond gun violence and that, I don't know if we're looking at like civic engagement and student-based activism that everything impacts students but on more kind of complex levels than adults sometimes so we've definitely started to branch into like education reform and climate change and um those other issues like my mentioned yeah so um we are both from connecticut and so the sandy hook shooting for sure 
I mean, we were relatively young. Like, I don't really remember. Yeah. I feel like it was, what year was it? Like, 2000? <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I don't know either. <laughs> I don't know the year. But um, we were relatively young. But I just remember um, how, and our state is so small that when one thing happens in one place, it kind of affects the whole entire state. Um, and so I, like that just like really impacted the way that our school functioned um, and like all school, I mean, all schools nationwide, but especially um, Connecticut, we really like cracked down on it. Um, and I just definitely seen the differences between how like my school functioned with like practicing lockdowns and practicing drills mm. and how like my, so I go to college in Pennsylvania and like my friends haven't necessarily had like as many drills as we have. Um, and so the impact, I had never even thought about gun violence, honestly, hardly ever until that school shooting happened. Um, yeah, so it was just so interesting to see how quickly that kind of changed everything for schools. Yeah, luckily enough, I don't think I was in Connecticut at that point. I think I moved after Sandy Hook from Maryland. I'm like 99% sure I was not here when that happened and I was still living in Maryland. But I do have uh, friends and all that. Uh, that was awkward. I just I played to camp for a minute. Okay. Yeah, I don't, mm, I don't think I've moved here. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> I may have. I may have just been too unaware. But I do have friends that... Um, were going to Sandy Hook or had people they babysitted that were in the Sandy Hook shooting and unfortunately passed away. Um, so goes to show that Connecticut and where these uh, gun violence acts happen, it, it affects the entire state or larger community as a whole. Uh, and it does intersect with other forms of issues like mental health to see that how it's impacted students' health uh, of fear and stuff like that and other realms as well which is interesting that um really i remember it happened oh all i feel like all the years blend together it was either junior or senior year of high school but um i remember there was like about a three-month span where our flag was at half mass every single day do just another tragedy after tragedy. And I was just like, what is happening to our country? Like, it was just, so I remember it was like the third week in a row and I like turned to my dad and I was like, the flag has been at half mass every single day. Like, it's just so sad to see how much is happening. And the fact that we have to grow up in this world and just kind of adjust to it is really sad and frightening. I agree. God damn, that just like gave me goosebumps thinking about that. Like, man, pretty, pretty dystopian. Yeah, remember, I thought you were going to reference when the false alarm, the shooting while we were presenting, uh, the seniors were presenting capstones happened for a mass shooting in our high school. And it was like, we, you know, you always prepare. And when this may not oh be, God. I'm going to be real oh right God. now. This may not be the right way because, but because it's so normalized, I feel like during lockdowns or practice lockdowns, rather, everyone goes under the desks or like behind the lab benches and you kind of just do rock, paper, scissors, shoot to pass the time. Um, I that mean, sounds bad, but it happens <laughs> because it's so normalized. Um, I don't know if that's the same thing in California. I know it is in Connecticut at least. Um, no, we have, we have, um, just like we have fire drills, maybe you guys don't have earthquake drills, we have earthquake drills. Um, but we do have uh, shooter drills, we turn off all the lights and then, you know, it's just part of the part of the yeah. stuff here, which is like Sarah said, really dystopian and scary. And I mean, yeah. stories like these, you know, where it's kind of like these little things where you don't know what exactly to do with like, you know, looking at the sticker on, like the ceiling in your classroom every day, knowing that that's where you're supposed to go. There's an active shooter in the school. Like, I don't know, these kind of like little moments where you're like, oh, we that's just, stickers. what did you say? Oh we yeah, we have at our school. It's like a, a system at our school because it's like everything's enclosed in really tight hallways because we're in um, a city. But oh, I yeah. 
these kind of moments are what we've like shared with legislators um, in a more formal setting, which has been like a really impactful part of, of our lobbying and kind of activism. And in addition to actually doing, you know, the legislative research that Sammy, like Maya's older brother did um, and, you know, preparing ourselves to be professional that we actually talk about the really, you know, human impact of like the epidemic of gun violence and how it disproportionately affects young people, like the constant threat of it too. Yeah, I suppose oh. under further consideration, I, I'm i starting to realize that that was probably a coping mechanism to kind of distract from like the reality that we have to practice for it. But uh, one day we had like a false, but like at the moment in our minds, it was like, shit, like it's happening. Like it's happening, like panic. My mm. teacher that I was in the room with was, because she had also been in a situation where she was in an active shooter situation at her school um, earlier in her career. And so she was, you know, swearing left and right, crying, having all of us duck. And we were all shaking like chihuahuas. It was crazy, but, and thank, thank God it was fake, but it really, that like small moment, like it impacts students, like you said, disproportionately. And the fact that we're so young and our minds are still, clay i suppose it'll it'll stay with you for a long time for sure so how so you were mentioning um like the legislative um piece is like really big um so can you just talk a little bit about how um you've like transitioned into more of the legislative aspect versus just like kind of marching in the streets and how that transition has been, how your experiences have been kind of going to legislation and stuff like that. Definitely, I mean, actually, I, we didn't really like describe the whole um, trajectory of, of BASTA, but just to give a little bit of background, um, it was, BASTA was kind of founded on the idea of like, what if we took our action, you know, to a legislative level of students beyond marching in the street, which I think is a really cool idea. So kind of that founding, class, um, which included Maya's brother and, you know, Maya joining like a leadership so young that um, I joined the first lobby day too. I think they planned the first lobby day in like a month, came up with the whole concept um, because that's kind of the season for um, looking at legislation, like advocating for bills in California. So um, within a month, these like high school seniors were able to organize over 300 um, high school kids from around the Bay Area and bring them on buses. Capital. Wait, sorry. What did you say, Maya? Sorry, there were juniors at the time, or at least Ruby and Sammy were. Oh, you were so right. My bad. They're they're like high school juniors, which is more <laughs> crazy to think about. Um, and um, yeah, organizing like all of these high school high schoolers um to go advocate for like common sense gun reform, do the research, and advocate for that, and present um themselves to to legislators. So that was kind of what BASTA started with. And actually now we've started to kind of go into other um, parts of like civic engagement and activism besides lobbying, I think. Maya, did you wanna, sorry, kind of like jumped in. No, it's all good. Um, I was just gonna give a couple examples of bills. So one of them was um, an 18 year old could get a long gun, but you had to be 21 to get a handgun. We, um, there was a bill to, Oh, a long gun? Is that what you were? A yeah. long <laughs> Sorry, oh, this I... is my, I just oh, completely okay. avoid looking at guns because I just don't like them. So, oh, so yeah, you're that... like, wait a minute, what is that? A long gun is like a rifle, like not a okay. pistol. So um, okay, thank uh, you. Some of the lingo that we picked up. Um, so, and then there was also one. So basically we helped to make it um, 21 for both kinds of guns. And then there was one that like, police had to track where their guns went like when they sold them which in retrospect my brother and I were looking at it it might have ended up just giving a lot of money to the police departments which um well, you know but at the time it seemed like you know you should take keep track of your guns so um those are just a couple of the examples um and what we did is we kind of, we tried to like get it down to like the basics of the bill. And so everybody knew what the bill was. It wasn't just like some people knew going in leading the meeting, like everybody was involved. We wanted to make sure that everybody felt like they were a part of the team. So, yeah. 
Definitely. And my bad, I know there's probably like responses to that. I mean, my just made me think of also kind of that about the nature of lobbying that makes it a little difficult to know if what you're doing actually has impact just as much as marching in the streets that I think that I've come to realize that lobbying is a level of accountability to, you know, elected officials and to people, um, you know, just regular citizens, but that it's not a band-aid for all of our issues. You know, we can't really place all of our faith um, in current like legal and justice systems. And I think that, I don't know, Hopefully that's been a public reckoning that a lot of people have had, but I think that it is an important level of like activism because it provides accountability and can give, you know, legal consequences to people who are committing gross acts of injustice some of the time. Absolutely. I think marching in a more of a traditional form of uh, visual, I shall say, visual activism, um, I think it, oftentimes it starts as a foundation and a pushing off place for greater legislation and whether it be from a lobbying, uh, from lobbying from groups themselves or from legislators that you put in office, I think that's the main purpose of it. In terms of the other side of activism, which is lobbying, I think there's greater power in, uh, once you've created the foundation, of course, and lobbying for your, the legislation you want than asking your legislator to come up with it because oftentimes, I feel like legislators can make false promises or log roll things in there that kind of almost reverse or mitigate the things that, you know, the titles will say. And so a lot of times you're able to kind of push for the things, the key things that you want, which is great, I think. Also, uh, the fact that like all of you guys went there originally, the 300 or whatever, that's incredible. That must have been like a sight to see. I just can't like, well, I suppose California is uh, a bigger state. So <laughs> the buildings are bigger, but I'm thinking it in terms of <laughs> Connecticut. I'm like, holy crap, <laughs> that's a lot of people in one building, but whatever. <laughs> it's, it felt like a ton of people. Definitely a lot of adrenaline in the consecutive lobby days. Too. Yeah, it was, it was, it was a lot of people. It was a lot of organization too. Um, sadly, we didn't get to do it this past year, um, our junior year because, you know, COVID and, but we did meet with legislators over Zoom. So we still got some work done and it felt nice to be able to keep that tradition going. But hopefully, you know, there's vaccine that's looking promising. <laughs> Maybe this year we'll be able to go with some precautions, but who knows? So speaking of COVID, um, how has um, the pandemic kind of impacted um, your work and kind of how has it like shifted your focus um, to what we, or to kind of adjusting to fit the new needs of people in your community? Definitely. I mean, I know that at first, kind of stepping into the position of, of president, I was like, okay, we can just kind of transpose all of our activities and, you know, work online. And then I realized that that's not really the case. Um, not just that, you know, it's difficult, but that they're, you know, changing needs that come with a pandemic for, for young people too. So um, in the past, we've kind of only had work center around like lobby day or in the past, like a voter forum. Um, but now we've really focused on kind of giving our student leaders and clubs some more, you know, attention um, and sending them media resources, conversations to have as a part of their community and um, kind of like just toolkits or like DIY guides for advocacy, which I kind of view as like mini lobbying. Um, so like contacting school administrators about, you know, ethnic studies curricula in their schools. Um, and now we're working on kind of a holding elected officials accountable uh, guide and these other little projects where it's tricky to think, you know, this isn't, you know, getting buses and going to the state capitol and organizing all these people. It's, you know, a different type of adrenaline, but it's still community organizing, which, which feels good to do. And I think it's also given us the opportunity to expand our leadership team. You know, when we were meeting in person, we were meeting in Berkeley and Oakland um, every week. And now we can have people from oh, the wider Bay Area. Um, we have Boston pasta. We used to have a tradition where we'd have pesto pasta 
uh, every meeting and you know you lose some things but you gain having people from San Francisco and San Leandro and it's really made our team like more I mean there's so many talented people on it it's made it more um, geographically diverse which I think is great absolutely and now let me ask you this outside of your you know traditional lobbying day and stuff like that you guys are comprised of 35 chapters right um and then you're like general uh administration i suppose um now that we are in a different age of activism i would say do you are is there any other way that like general body meetings you guys have like general body meetings with this is probably a lot of people, but all the 35 chapters that are, whoever's able to attend from those together on like a giant Zoom where you discuss general things for everyone all together at once. A good question. Um, we actually haven't had any kind of group Zooms um, so far. I think that it's come up a few times about whether that would be a really helpful thing, but ultimately we've realized that as like high schoolers doing Zoom school that we just like have so much Zoom fatigue. Um, that we don't know if that would be the most impactful thing to offer club leaders. Although we've been sending out like a newsletter and kind of trying to give them more support. Cause I think that um, a lot of, you know, kids have been trying to get more involved with activism in their communities, which is fantastic. There's no, you know, benchmark or, or measure. It's important to, to get involved in some way um, to, to like help your community um, and like advocate for what's important for you. So we're just trying to be the best, conduit for that you know with with our abilities of um emailing and you know knowing other kids um so we've tried to connect some club leaders so that they can talk about you know issues happening in their community but it's a good idea actually we should look back into that thank you i hadn't even thought of the whole zoom fatigue thing <laughs> that's on me because like i it's only been like a year or less than that but i or I suppose a year because we didn't actually have Zoom and when we were in high school, we just did Google Classroom and then do whatever, you know? But I totally forgot about the fact that you have like seven or so classes depending on what school you're at. And it's like either, you know, back to back every day or what have you. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> yeah, the whole Zoom, like I know for me has been exhausting um, looking at a screen and my brain just don't go well together. Um, so, and I'm on a board here, a res life board, um, at school and it's definitely challenging trying to find ways to integrate, um, kids that are living in dorms cause they're like alone. There's not as much, so there's not like the social aspect that's typically there in college. Um, and it's been hard just trying to find ways to get everyone involved because like the last thing that people want to do is sit on a zoom call and like play Kahoot, which right. we just did, but um, it's amazing that you guys are still like, still really active, um, and still like making an impact through all of this. You guys, you're doing amazing work. This is like so cool. Oh my gosh, we should get involved. Our high school needs some help. <laughs> oh, mine does too. My high school, yeah. It's okay. <laughs> um. Doing our best. Oh, go ahead. Thank you so much. That means a lot. Like, I really appreciate that. Yeah. You have been getting involved in um, mul a multitude of areas. So you're doing climate, environment, kind of similar, kind of different. Um, <laughs> um, and so another big aspect that you guys are starting to get into is food. And so um, Nourish My Soul and From the Ground Up is very food justice centered. So can you talk a little bit about um, how you are transitioning into that um, avenue as well. Ooh, maybe, sorry, I think I explained it a little misleadingly. I don't think that BASTA as an organization right now is like getting involved in, in food justice. That's more oh, of like okay. a, but because I'm really passionate about it, hopefully um, we can do something with that um, before I graduate this, this spring. But mm -hmm. um, just like a little bit as, as far as like Oakland, the history of Oakland and food justice, um, like starting the Black Panthers breakfast program in the 60s, I think that I mean, I don't know, I feel like that's a cool essential example of, of like food justice of really like nourishing, you know, your community. And um, now there's like city slicker farms and all these really cool kind of 
urban farm programs and food collectives and what we call like town fridges that are shared on Instagram where it's like a take it, leave it fridge. I'm sure that you guys have that over there. Miles we do away. not. <laughs> oh, no. I've seen okay. them on Instagram because I, ha- I follow the hashtags like hashtag food justice and I keep seeing them. I'm like, this is so yeah. cool. But oh, I don't. All- yeah, <laughs> we don't have them. <laughs> but that's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> That's like connected through that but I think that it's just kind of this like haven for for food justice and that connects to like Basta's mission to like inspire and nourish and like I mean I know those kind of may seem like vague um connections but uh I think that I don't know food food justice is awesome there's a lot of cool potential for it so maybe we can can see in the future how we can get involved with some of those existing organizations and kind of make their work easier um or you know get students involved in that. Yeah, that's so cool. In cities, food apartheid is pretty uh, prevalent and big. So I was going to ask if... Mm, I actually haven't heard that term food apartheid before. And I've been seeing recently a shift, and that's why I used food apartheid instead of food deserts. I, you may know that from... I don't think they talked about food deserts in Omnivores and Alma. I, yeah, we're aware what food deserts are. Okay, <laughs> so they're shifting apparently to food apartheid as a more uh, I, uh, correct, I guess, term or usage of the term because uh, food desert implies that it nothing's there for like no reason. Um, food apartheid speaks more to the fact that the reason why the the, the food deserts, I guess, exist is because of uh, uh, systematic reasoning and uh, the strategic placement of people. So that's why I use the term food apartheid instead of food desert. I thought it was- That was really interesting. I mean, I figured like that it connected to kind of that whole idea of like food ecosystems and deserts and swamps, et cetera. But that was really cool to have that explanation. Thank you. Yes, even though that was probably not as clear as I could have made it. <laughs> you were welcome. Um, so jumping back to the um, advocacy and the legislation. Um, So Bella and I and a couple of our um, members from from the ground up um, took a trip to DC and we met with um, representatives and kind of just talked about some of the issues facing uh, mainly mainly students in food justice and um, just young people kind of. And one thing that really stuck out to stuck out to me was in, I want to say it was our last meeting, um, we were meeting with um, a Tenet. person who works, yes, a person who works with uh, Representative Johanna Hayes. And we were just kind of explaining all the issues with um, like food programs and how a lot of students schools don't have proper food programs for their students and to nourish them and stuff. And one thing that he said that I remember to this day, he said, so what are you asking for? He was like, if you're going to um, go to legislation and like, if you have these goals in mind, make sure that you know what you're exactly looking for to get out of it. So it could be productive. Um, So what are um, so Maya talked about some of the specific bills um, that you guys are working on. And can you just talk about kind of maybe like the, if there's any progress on them and kind of how that's unfolding in your area? Absolutely. I mean, I, Maya's probably well-versed in, in legislative stuff compared to me, legislative stuff, even like <laughs> that kind of indicates my, my knowledge um, of, you know, bills in a more comprehensive way. But I think that over half of the bills that we've lobbied for have have passed just kind of comprehensively throughout the three um, lobby days. And as you know, the first two years focused on, um, you know, mainly gun violence laws, including some like gun violence restraining orders, um, GVROs, which like are a big part of our legislation, just in case anyone out there is curious, um, good to look into for, for your date, wherever you are. And um, then last year's um, environmental kind of centered lobby day had a lot of environmental education bills um, about K through 12, like climate crisis education. And that was really important. To us. I think that it really fit into kind of our whole 
mission and call to action um, as an organization. So I think that just communicating like with legislators, like why we're, we're lobbying for things, it's not always, you know, obvious um, and kind of appealing to shared values. You know, we both want, you know, to work towards something that's more perfect um, towards a better society. And I mean, those are really vague things, but it's, it's good to connect with people. Like when you're meeting with um, like a Republican, you know, Congressman from Bakersfield, then you can have, you know, shared values in that um, he probably wants his kids to be safe at school. And there's some, you know, way to, to appeal to, to those maybe different values. What is it, Kenya? Ethos, pathos, and logos? Right. Are you I mean, AP lit from last year? <laughs> or is that AP Lang? Oh, God. Lang. AP Lang. But I, oh. because, but I mean, at the end of the day, it's, yeah, it's modes of persuasion. Say. Yeah. Um, well, it's kind of tangential, but if you want to, like, add anything on to that, <laughs> I did not give you a good foundation to, like, jump off of, but um I don't know I think I think you hit it on the head <clears throat> absolutely no but yeah finding your why and then kind of communicating your why as to why the, the other person should even though you know their party does not stand for that and change or uh whatnot uh finding the why and then trying to figure out how that why <laughs> this is gonna get real <laughs> confusing right now <laughs> how that why will be the why <laughs> for <laughs> if anyone yeah. could follow that. Um, there's also probably a different way you could say that that would make 100% sense, but that's just how the flow chart in my brain worked at that moment. So there you go. Hey, I like it. It, it works. The why, the extended why. <laughs> yeah. What's your message to other kids that you are your age, or maybe you're a little younger or in middle school that are looking to start into activism. But as we all know, before we, you know, jump and we're like a couple years in, it's very intimidating. So what's your message to them and kind of advice to give them? Good, Kenya? Beautiful. I mean, uh, oh, go ahead, sir. You know, my ego first, I've gone first a few times. <laughs> Sorry, because I keep right. No problem. Uh, I would say like, I think a lot of people think like, oh, I've got to start my own activist group or I need to start completely my own thing. That's completely not the case. Like join an existing group. They want your support. They want your work, your teamwork. Like they want you. Like there are tons of organizations out there. I know it seems like the thing to do is to start a new one, but chances are there's an organization that's doing similar things that you want to do. So I would say just like find something that really sits well with you, sits with your like personal mission. I would say like write down things you want to accomplish and then find a group that aligns with those values and those goals. That's like literally the best. I, that's brilliant. <laughs> I think that that's like honestly the first, you know, advice that that people should take um, as two follow up points. I would just say that you know don't let um, maybe your anxiety about like how terrible everything may seem and like kind of the impenetrable nature of like you know justice systems and like. I don't know if you're looking really big, like capitalism and and like maybe slavery and genocide and like colonization. I don't know, I'm listing things, but when you look at the history of the world and how it's led us, you know, to where we are right now and kind of where that will be for your future as a young person, it can feel overwhelming specifically, you know, if you have like marginalized, you know, identities as, as part of who you are. But I would say that don't, you know, let the overwhelmingness of everything get in your way of, being, you know, engaged in some way that getting engaged in a small way, whether it's like advocating for something at your school or like partnering with, you know, existing organizations that, you know, have shared values, like Maya was talking about, that doing really small things can can snowball in a meaningful way until you're running the show or you're, you know, doing something that's a really important part of your life. And on that, um, I would make sure that, I don't know, I feel like we're in an age where kind of like everyone's expected to be an activist in a way, which can get a little risky because where there's this like 
you know, idea of allyship. There's like all these think pieces out there. I mean, <laughs> you can read all those, um, but that there's like this idea of like benchmark activism. I like to think of it as in once you reach a benchmark, then you've done, you, you know, you've checked some box that I don't think that activism is some, you know, static definable thing. It's being civically engaged. It's caring about your community and, you know, the wider um, place and people, you know, that, that you live around. So interpret that in your own way, try and make the world a better place. Sounds so vague, but define that in your own way and kind of never be satisfied with one thing, keep on going. And hopefully once you get in involved, you'll like kind of have that realization in your own way. I think that's been really important for me. I have three points to bring up that you guys gave me the little Eureka type thing in my brain when you mentioned them. Uh, at least for the one you just mentioned, uh, performative activism. If you find that you're not wanting or you're not as engaged or uh, you don't find your why uh, for the more mainstream activisms that are going on, look for smaller activisms. You're probably going to find your why or your passion in those ones. So it, you don't think you have to stick to the main ones that are happening. You'll eventually find your whys for those uh, as you go on in the more specific activism that you like. Um, in terms of local things, I know our school, or not our school anymore, but um, <laughs> they had this thing where you could I don't, write a page or something like that ask, saying why you want to join and then you could become a, like a youth uh, school board member or something to give the youth perspective to you like once a month. I'm sure lots of schools have that. That's usually no one's going out for that because it's not like student gov or stuff. So that might be a nice little leeway in to advocate for your fellow students on a more casual ish basis. And then oh, the last one had to do with the beginning. Oh, aha. It's really hard unless you stumble. I, I stumbled upon it and then I kind of brought it to light for Kenya and my friends, uh, at least for From the Round Up, to find local activism or activist groups for youth or not for youth. Uh, if it's not like super like uh, mainstream or like March for Our Lives and like the more larger corporation or not corporations, organizations. Um, so ways to find it within your area would probably just be starting to find like, or follow the hashtags on Instagram of different kinds of activism. And a lot of times they'll like, just give you like random posts that are like those hashtags are in and you can find groups within Georgia or like if you click on the post or Connecticut, that's how I found a lot of them or just going to one main person you find. So say March for Our Lives and then doing the drop down and kind of going through those people that are like suggested because it may be a little bit of a digging to find those places though so don't get discouraged from that yeah um I think just one thing to remember is that I mean everyone cares about something and just speak about it like it if like joining an organization is amazing and you get to meet so many new people who are like passionately advocating along with you but even in your day-to-day -day life like just bring it up in conversations, like whatever you care about, no matter what it is, um, just offer that perspective. And that kind of, all of our different ideas get, getting into activism kind of translates perfectly into the quote for this week, um, which is how wonderful it is that nobody needs to wait a single moment before starting to improve the world. And that was written by Anne Frank. Um, oh my God, guys, I'm really bad. No, that was written yeah. by Anne Frank. <laughs> Um, when she was hiding with her family, it was written in her journal. And I love this quote just because, um, and we touched on it, like Sarah and Maya touched on it perfectly. Um, there's like that pressure of, I have to be some like Martin Luther King, I have to be some martyr, um, to make a change in this world. And it starts with the smallest action and it snowballs and um, ends up becoming something bigger. So- um, Starts with the John Lewis's, not the Martin Luther King's. So being on the streets protesting <laughs> to becoming, you see that analogy? That was there beautiful. I'm the back of myself there. Um, oh, I think it's so egotistical, but <laughs> that was great. Yeah, so <laughs> I just really liked that quote. And I think that's what BASTA has done and that's how they started. And 
now, I mean, look at them. They're just taking over the nation by Still storm. Still in the game. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, so go ahead. Oh, I was going to say that, I mean, the work, learning about the work that you're doing too um, is, is so awesome knowing that that's out there eventually um, for people who are, you know, passionate about food justice and, and podcasts and, you know, connecting with media. So it's been awesome to connect with you too. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so feel free to like promote your social media, your website, your work. Anyway, you, get you guys can yeah, places that you, people can donate to you guys. Um, All that jazz. Like <laughs> Thank you. Um, our, our website is Bay Area Student Activist. You can just look that up. If you happen to be located um, in the San Francisco Bay Area, then you can click that handy form on our website to get involved. If not, I'm sure that there's an awesome student activist organization wherever you are. I urge you to, to get involved with them and... Um, our Twitter is at Vasta Activists, Instagram, Bay Area Student Activists. And yeah, DM us, connect with us. We look forward to, to meeting you. Our email is bayareastudentactivists at gmail.com. Oh. Directly to Sarah and me. So okay. yeah. Right. We'll, we'll even sign it with our names. Um, that's very important. As you, as you can notice, everything's about Bay Area Student Activists. So <laughs> you can find us. Yeah, I just realized we also have an email. <laughs> Oh, we're not going to talk about the email though that we have. Um, we'll talk about that in the next one. <laughs> Every time I, it comes up to this point of time and someone mentions a new way to connect to them and I'm like, shit, we have that way too. And I have not been talking about it. Um, at any rate, <laughs> oh, and our YouTube. So you can follow us or locate us on our website, which is nourishmysoul.org on our Instagram or Facebook for Nourish My Soul, which is just Nourish. Oh, actually, I don't think Facebook is the same handle as. Let's re rewind. Facebook is just probably Nourish My Soul. Instagram is Nourish All underscore under case. Nourish dot my dot soul. And then from the ground up, uh, Instagram page is from, but like without the O and then ground up. And then you can also find our podcast on Nourish My Soul's YouTube page, or wait for it, we're on more platforms now. Uh, Anchor, Breaker, I've never heard of it, but it's there, um, hopefully. Google Podcast, Pocket Cast, which is like cast as in like, oh, actually I don't, I was about to say like how you spell like cast as in like you put on your arm, but I actually don't think that's how you spell that. Oh, actually, I actually don't know. Never mind. <laughs> Pocket Cast, Radio Public, one word, and then Spotify. So access us there. And then email us, but I will give you the email in the next podcast. So don't actually email us yet. Actually, just DM <laughs> us. DM us on Instagram. Yeah, DM on us. Or Instagram. if you really want to email us and you want to go kind of old fashioned, not really, because it's not paper and pen. You can find our email probably on our website if you are so inclined to do so. So have fun. Yes, yes. It'll be a treasure hunt, but have fun. Thank you again to Sarah and Maya um, with Bay Area Student Activists. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed listening um, to this episode and all the amazing work that they are doing. I hope it encourages you to start making an impact in whatever way you deem fit you deem necessary. Um, and yes. Peace out, um, Girl Scouts. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Thank you for coming, <laughs> or not coming, but being on. Okay. 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 <laughs>